May we have your attention. The flight has been delayed. We repeat, the flight has been delayed. It is November 2024. Approximately 10 years ago, North Korea began diverting resources away from its burgeoning nuclear weapons program into developing what may be seen as one of the most effective cyber war programs in the world. Tensions between the United States and North Korea are at an all-time high. North Korea has declared that it intends to attack every network in the United States and to exploit the vulnerabilities of, the, of any, the security vulnerabilities of any devices connected to the internet. North Korea has begun attacking our electrical power grid infrastructure. We are seeing rolling power outages uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the country as backup generators are, uh, are, are, that are failing, that are connected to the internet. We're seeing trains and our transportation network that is being disrupted as airplanes are no longer able to fly while our radar systems are being jammed. As a result of the disruption to the transportation networks, we're seeing that food and water in grocery stores are becoming scarce. We're seeing that our communications networks are under attack. People are unable to work in office buildings without an internet connection. They find themselves resorting to paper and a pen and landline telephones. We're seeing that hospitals are unable to access electronic health records and as a result are only able to provide emergency care. The global banking infrastructure is, being, is, is, is grounding to a halt. ATMs are unable to dispense cash. Businesses are finding that their confidential trade secrets, their intellectual property is being stolen by hackers. And at this same time in November 2024, American citizens across the country are prepared preparing to vote in the next election in voting booths that are connected at a time when confidence in the integrity of our election system is at an all-time low. Now this may seem like an outlandish scenario at first, but let me assure you that North Korea has been laying the groundwork for an effective cyber war program for years now. In 2014, North Korea was behind the attack on Sony that you heard about from Melody uh, the other day. In 2015, North Korea attacked banks in Vietnam and the Philippines. In 2016, as you heard from Tim Maurer yesterday, North Korea was successful in stealing $81 million from the Bangladeshi National Bank. And last year, North Korea is reportedly behind the WannaCry attack that ultimately took down Britain's National Health Service. North Korea is able to exploit, North Korea and lots of bad actors, are able to exploit vulnerabilities in security. They're able in particular to take advantage of the fact that we have begun to embrace, some would say blindly at times, and trust a lot of technology. We've on, we're on a race, in fact, to connect everything to the internet. We've seen an explosive growth in internet-connected devices. The Internet of Things by 2020 is predicted to have approximately 30 to 50 billion devices connected to the Internet. I want you to think about that. That is approximately seven devices per person on Earth. That growth is not going to stop. It is something that's already here. And what we're talking about when we say the Internet of Things is everything from your, your smart you know, phone and your smart watches to your smart home devices to wearable technologies to uh, medical uh, technologies that are connected to the Internet, like your pacemaker. And while this growth is so great uh, for, for, for tech companies uh, in particular and for engineers, it also has great benefit to consumers 
themselves. We are seeing improvements in the ability of doctors to diagnose a, uh, a, a, um, a disease earlier. We're seeing improvements in traffic patterns. We're seeing reductions in, in potential reductions in uh, accidents among cars. We're seeing improvements to potential climate issues that this can all that 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 uh, the IoT can bring to us. But with this, you know, great growth also comes, we're seeing a great increase in the number of cyber attacks that are also taking place and that are exploiting the vulnerabilities in the Internet of Things devices. Let's use, for example, the, uh, the, the, the rise in uh, distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks over the last few years. Deloitte regularly um, tracks this, uh, keeping, uh, measuring the amount of data uh, across the Internet. Between 2013 and 2015, the amount, the largest, the largest DDoS attacks, as measured by the volume of, of junk data, were 300, 400, and 500 gigabits per second. By 2016, the largest we saw just a year later was two terabits per second. That is a massive increase in the number of attacks that we're seeing, and this is no doubt due in part to the rise in the number of Internet of Things connected devices. Now, while IoT has all these great benefits, the security vulnerabilities that are there also come with great risks. Some of the easy ones that everyone knows are obviously privacy. Right? It's clear that you have all these devices that are collecting massive amounts of information and that uh, have the risk that that information could be disclosed to an unauthorized uh, third party. But beyond that, what we're seeing with the Internet of Things is it's fundamentally changing the way that we think about technology. You see, with my phone, we have a great device that integrates a number of other devices into it. Right? It integrates my camera into it. It integrates my traditional phone. It integrates a computer uh, into this one device. But it, for the most part, knows what I tell it, and that's what I'm, I'm, I'm doing. But with the Internet of Things, what we're finding is that the devices themselves are beginning to know more information about us than we know about ourselves. And that gets scary pretty quickly to a lot of people. We're also seeing the risks for discrimination. As Internet of Things de connect devices are used more often, we're seeing that there is great potential for their use in, uh, in housing, in insurance, in employment, and that this could give rise to discrimination on the basis of either practices or genetics or some other factors uh, that may be tracked. We're seeing that there's also uh, the potential uh, around the vulnerability to hacking. And what I mean by this is what fundamentally separates the Internet of Things from a lot of the other technologies uh, that, that we talk about here is that the risks are not just, um, just to civil liberties. The risks here actually are to the life and the physical safety of a lot of people on this earth. And that, that is critical that we understand that when lives are in danger, we need to have a proper response to it. Now, the challenges to, coming, to overcoming these risks are quite, hard, are quite difficult um, when it comes to the IoT. Part of this just has to do with the fact that there are billions and billions of these devices that are out there, and they're coming out more quickly every single day. It's hard to track all of this and to ensure that the security on all these billions of devices, no matter where they are you know, input into the stream of commerce, have up-to-date security. We also see that with the drive, the race to sort of connect everything to the Internet, that there, is, there are a lot of companies that don't have the experience, the security experience, that is needed to actually engineer in and maintain for the future up-to-date um, and current security standards. There's an inability for a lot of these companies to patch, to either figure out a way to, dis you know, to distribute a patch, or, um, or moreover, uh, to, to be able to have consumers know that they need to update their devices. And if you want a simple example of this, just think about the last time you updated your Fitbit with the new you know, security protections that may be um, necessary. The devices themselves, unlike our phone, where we generally expect to get rid of it every two to three years, when we're talking about internet connected, a lot of these devices are meant to last you know, five years, 10 years, or even a potential lifetime when you're talking about devices um, like pacemakers, um, for example. But in terms of the other devices, right? you're thinking about a stove, no one really wants to replace their stove every two or three years. But what happens when these companies go out of business? 
Who's left to go and make sure that they receive security updates? Who's left to make sure they don't become a vector for the next botnet attack that we see? We have come to this situation where we are finding ourselves in a collective action problem. Because when I go out and buy my smart toaster, I know that I just want it to make toast. And as long as it heats it up and I'm able to control it from my phone, I feel like I got the benefit of the bargain. Similarly, the manufacturer of the toaster feels like they sold me the toaster, it works, you know, I'm happy, they've made their money and we all move on. But who's going to maintain the responsibility in the future for ensuring that that, uh, that, that, that security is updated and who has the incentive to do it? This is a classic issue for government to come in and solve. The problem is that when it comes to the regulation of technology, the government is slow. And what do I mean by slow? Well, I mean the government lacks the sophistication necessary to understand a lot of the risks and how to resolve those risks. I mean that the legislative process that we use to regulate in this country is designed to be cumbersome. It is designed to be slow. It is designed to have laws that last for a decade, not laws that last for a month. We have an organization of the government that is siloed, where we have numerous government agencies that are all playing and looking at it just from their angle, but we don't have one agency that at the end of the day has the ability to say, here is what the standards are for cybersecurity. And we have a global problem. This is not just true in the United States, it is true worldwide. And finally, we have a situation where even if we in the United States can figure out a solution to regulating the Internet of Things, we have to figure out how to figure out a solution for other countries because the devices can easily cross a border. How easy is it for me to bring a new Alexa device from the Philippines to the United States? It is not a challenge for me to do that as an individual. It's a challenge to keep it out. We need to come up with a solution. And there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot, everyone has a role in improving security in this. We have consumers that, can be ed that, that need to educate themselves on security, that need to make sure that, they're, uh, doing, that, that they are updating their, their devices. We need to also make sure that the government and the businesses understand that security is important. We also need to have the Industry Act, though. The industry can do everything from educating consumers to rolling out patches to self-regulatory, to creating a self-regulatory regime to also you know, seeking uh, support from the government. But it's most important in a scenario like this where no one has the incentive to actually um, step up and do security for, for, for everything in the I-2 that the government has to act as well. And the government, look, ha has short-term actions. And I really want to spend the balance of my time talking to you about what I think that at least the United States government can do to approach this. In the very short term, the government has the ability to educate. It can educate consumers, it can educate the industry about privacy and security when it comes to IoT. But it also can provide guidance and it has the ability to enforce the laws that are currently on the books. Now, the problem with those laws is they were written for an analog world and we're in a digital world. And we fundamentally find ourselves in the solution where we're trying to take these laws that were written for an entirely different technology and apply it to modern technologies uh, today. But the government is also one of the largest purchasers of IoT devices in the country, if not the largest. It can use its purchasing power. It can also, through the president, use, you know, put, use its executive authority to issue an executive order around privacy um, and security. You know, for example, um, seeking to recognize that certain devices might create a national security threat and trying to ban those from the United States. But today I want to put forward a different proposal to you. And I'd like to posit the possibility that we in the United States could implement and develop a new government agency. Now I know many of you like me are skeptical of new government agencies, but it's not just that we need a new government agency, we need a new kind of government agency if we are going to deal with the rapidly evolving threats that we're currently not able to grapple with. This new government agency has to be smart about how it regulates. And to do that, it needs to, 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 to have a, a different kind of mission. I like to call this agency the Central Cybersecurity Administration. Now let me recognize I'm not the first person on earth to come up with the idea of a new government agency, although I think the proposal that I'm gonna put forward to you today um, is one that hasn't been uh, said yet, but Bruce Schneier for many years at Harvard, one of my colleagues in the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard, um, has been setting this forward. This, this new uh, Central Cybersecurity Administration would be a centralized body for all IT and cybersecurity issues across the government. This is important um, for us to have because we need to be able to harmonize, we need to be able to talk across agencies. It would send a signal to both the private and public sector that 
I, that, that privacy and security are very important to this country. It would have better resources than the current government agencies have because it would be on a directed mission to deal with cybersecurity. And more importantly, it would have the expertise and the specific legislative authority necessary to handle issues with the IoT. Hopefully, this would engender better security solutions um, and better regulatory reforms. And then, most importantly, it would have a mission of making sure that uh, the security and health and safety is protected. This is extremely important because I assure you that if we don't get a hold of security now, there will be a major disaster that will come to this country. And when it does, the government is going to quickly begin to regulate. We saw this after September 11th. You saw the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. We saw it after the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. You saw the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Let's get on top of this right now rather than having to worry about and deal with it later. What do I mean by a new kind of federal agency? Well, this agency's mission would be to ensure good IoT or an IT health. And how might this agency go about doing that? Well, first of all, it would work with the industry uh, to ensure that there are good best practices that are outlined. We sort of see the U.S. government doing this you know, right now with the NTIA and its uh, cybersecurity uh, initiative around the Internet of Things. But it would also work to establish standards. Standards around privacy, for example, notice and consent or breach notification. Standards around security, dealing with um, uh, patches and rolling out patches and encryption. But in addition to that, uh, this agency would also potentially explore a licensing regime, right? It is now the case that engineers, computers you know, engineers, ought to be treated like professionals, just like lawyers and doctors and everyone else that has any impact on life and safety. It might be that we want an agency that is going to license them and establish standards for the professionals, but also an agency that can approve and license devices like the FCC does right now, or it's outsourced um, um, to others to do, but, 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 but we, can, we can do that. This agency needs the ability to also ban devices when they should not be in the United States, when there are security uh, and, 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 and privacy vulnerabilities. We saw this uh, come out of Germany last year when they banned the baby Kayla doll, my baby Kayla doll, uh, as a result of security concerns with those devices. We need to have the ability here to be able to take devices off the networks that are threats to the entire network, and there needs to be an agency able to do that. It also, but we also have to think about you know, other agencies and looking at the safety and security and privacy of devices. We have a Consumer Product Safety Commission in this country that for years and decades has removed devices or looked at them for safety issues. But they don't look at them for privacy and security. This agency would. The agency would also have the authority to ensure that we are harmonizing and have one set of rules across, across the industry and moreover across the government. Right now in government, we don't have one agency that has final say. You know, I was the chief of enforcement at the FCC from 2014 to 2017. In that capacity for those three, you know, for the last three years ago, uh, I was the enforcer of net neutrality uh, for this country. Uh, I was the last enforcer of net neutrality uh, as of now. Um, what I saw when it came to cybersecurity is that there are a ton of government agencies that have a role in cybersecurity. The Federal Communications Commission, the Federal Trade Commission, the Security and Exchange Commission, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Transportation, the Food and Drug Administration, this alphabet soup of government agencies doesn't have an agency that has final say, that has the ability to bring everyone to the table and say this is what it's going to be. This agency would. The agency would also have the ability to enforce the regulations that it uh, puts on the books. And moreover, it would have a responsibility to ensure the defense of the country when there is a cyber attack. I would suggest that it oversee two, uh, two bodies. One would be the Corps of Computer Engineers and the other is the Cyber National Guard. By the Corps of Computer Engineers, I'm thinking of an analogy to our Army Corps of Engineers. This is a Corps of Engineers that are brought to the government to help ensure that our digital infrastructure is safe and secure. We would have a Cyber National Guard, another Corps of Engineers, like many of the people here, that would be in charge of making sure that when we are attacked, they are deployed to help deal with the ramifications and to help the industry and the government in responding to that. And moreover, this agency would coordinate internationally. 
And that's critically important at a time when we don't have one government agency that can speak to cybersecurity for the United States on the national uh, state, on the international stage. The global threat here ultimately requires a lot of government agencies to finally step up to the table from across the world and handle, and handle this situation. When I initially started uh, my talk with you this morning, I know that the North Korea uh, scenario seemed a little bit outlandish at first. While it is today the case that, you know, that's probably not going to happen, in the next few years, that really is a risk. And unless we begin to think about cybersecurity seriously, unless we're able to get our government to recognize that it has a role, not only in education, but in bringing engineers into government, increasing its sophistication, beginning to think about new tools that it can take to respond to the threats that we see on the cyber stage, we are ultimately all going to suffer from it. I hope uh, you've enjoyed my presentation this morning. I look forward to any questions and, and to discussing it with anyone after the presentation too.